they, of course we know they move on to Bill Watts, UWF, and that's where Borden is going to transform into sting and warrior is eventually going to leave and sting is on his way of sorts. So the tag team breaks up here with Bill Watts. We know that, uh, Jim Helwig is going to cruise over to world-class and become the dingo warrior. Sting's going to stay put here with the UWF. And before you know it, the UWF is purchased by Jim Crockett promotions. And now that means he's going to be wrestling on TBS national television. Uh, just, uh, I mean, think about that really. I mean, you're talking about just, a a couple of years into your wrestling career and you're on national TV and then the big opportunity, which is what will be celebrated this Sunday clash of the champions, March of 88. He's going to take on the NWA world champion. They go to a 45 minute draw. I know there were people with stopwatches who say it wasn't exactly 45 minutes, whatever <laughs> theater of the mind. We went heads up with WrestleMania. Let's not forget the prior November. WWE created survivor series out of thin air to sabotage Starcade. fast forward a couple of months, dusty books, the bunkhouse stampede and the pay-per-view providers don't let Vince do what he did with the survivor series. So instead he does create another event, but offers it on free TV, make sure nobody watches that bunkhouse stampede. And that became known as the Royal rumble. So now dusty. And, and David and certainly Jimmy are pissed and they think, okay, you're going to put WrestleMania on pay-per-view. We're going to TBS and we're getting a, a special and we're going to have our NWA world champion, our biggest draw, Ric Flair, go out there in the main event with this bright neon young superstar on the verge of becoming a megastar. Sting was a made man that night and it all happened heads up with a WrestleMania. Talk about faith and confidence from the coach, whether we're talking about Dusty or Jimmy or Rick for that matter, to put Sting in that spot at the Coliseum in Greensboro. And even crazier to think, there's going to be a multiple of people to see Sting's last match compared to what was there at that clash in 88. Isn't that crazy to think about? The, the whole thing is surreal. Now, I don't want to miss this point. Conrad, I don't think we've done a podcast where I did a little research before I received the research. Um, have you ever done that? Hell no. You already know. But anyway, so Conrad, I'm going to kind of give you my perspective on this. Sure. Kind of look at the, look, they're two different human beings. Um, I, I, I'll say this with all due respect and um, another one of your podcasters or a couple, but I know another one of your podcaster probably says it a little bit brutally more honest than me. I don't think you'll find anybody that has a bad thing to say about Sting. Is that face? Oh, absolutely safe to say. I've never met one person who had a bad word to say about Steve Borden or the character Sting. Have you ever met someone that's maybe had a bad word to say about Jim Hellwick? I've never heard anyone say a nice word about him. <laughs> and, and, and that's unfortunate because he was one of my favorites as a kid. But So, so kind of, I'm going to throw this on you. Diplomatically. Yeah. <laughs> no, when I look at their careers and I, obviously I like to give my dad credit. He, he picked the two, but when you kind of look at, they both were let go and then they both went to Watts. What a integral role riding in the car and being on camera. Eddie Gilbert was just oh, well said, well said. I just think on you know, and, and look, we, we don't travel like we used to. And, and, and look, I'm not trying to go back on yesteryear, but you know, I, I know what an education I got, uh, six or seven nights a week, riding in the car with old timers and talking. And even when I got to the WWF, uh, riding in a car with Scott Hall and, 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 and Kevin Nash and different folks. I, I did runs with Fuji. I did runs with, uh, Mike Rotundo, uh, all kind of different, you know, veterans and you just hear different stories. And I, I was always, heck, you can tell on the podcast, me and Conrad, well, it, it's just in the DNA. I like to kind of learn like that. Well, I think Sting's a lot like that in his formative years that Eddie took a liking to him, saw dollar signs in him in multiple ways, but the amount of education that Sting got 
that was psychology, not so much. He had the athletic ability, but him being able to tie the pieces, my gut tells me Watts didn't want to deal with him, uh, didn't have room for him, sent him to Dallas. I'm not sure that Dallas, but Dallas didn't have, you know, their circuit was different, and I'm not sure who his mentor was, and I'm not real sure how how Jim progressed from a psychological standpoint in the wrestling industry, learning the ins and outs, learning the nuances, learning the timing, learning all the specific things that you really got to figure out. Um, now God took care of him and he went up and his body sold to Vince and the ultimate warrior and the rest is history. I'm just saying for Sting to be prepared for a 45 minute draw, I think you've got to give credit to those watch years, specifically Eddie Gilbert and others. And then you just said it when they're looking at that roster and they're going to go head up uh, against Mania, and this would have been, what, Mania 5 in um, four. Atlantic City? Four? Yeah. In Atlantic and, City still, but yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you just kind of look at that and go, wow, they are taking the uh, up-and-comer and putting him on the map, and the confidence that, that Rick had in him. Uh, but most importantly, they would have never put him out there had they not listened to the people and going, yep, this is going to be our best bet. It's it's so it's fascinating to kind of look at the trajectory of Sting's career and how we get to, you know, put a bow on it in the same city uh, 30 something years later. It's it's very, very cool. What's crazy to me is to think that there were only 6000 people in the building for that show. And you're going to have nearly three times that for Sting's last match. Wow. Isn't that, isn't that wild? And, and so that's 88. Yeah. Well, Hulkamania mm -hmm. was, was, uh, running wild. It was running wild. And that's when, if you recall, that's when Savage won the tournament to become the champ because Hogan was going to take the summer off to go fill no, no holds barred. Wow. Uh, by late 89, the wheels are in motion. For Sting to beat Flair and win the NWA world title. It was supposed to happen on February 25th, 1990, which would have been Flair's 41st birthday there in Greensboro, the site of the original match. It was all supposed to happen on pay per view. We know that didn't happen because Sting messed around and tore an ACL, shooting an angle with the horseman just 19 days before the match. So it gets pushed back to July of 1990. Think about that too. The dude tears his knee up in February of 90 and he's back in July winning the thing in Baltimore wearing the uh, American flag get up. What a, what a special moment that was. It was a big moment in his career and now he's on top in July of 1990 and Sting was really kind of the franchise of WCW, maybe even the cornerstone even with the arrival of Hulk Hogan in 94, I mean, he was the franchise player. Now, of course, we know when, when Hogan's here, that's going to level up some of your other business metrics. 